Thinking joy, this is something that I think the world needs right now. Just getting our joy back. And joy is not happiness, but we have joy in the Lord. Community. We want to be with each other. We want to know what's going on in one another's lives. What does the Bible tell us about joy? How do we encourage each other. Laugh, probably cry, because that's what happens. <laughs> Even though we're coming back to church, things are returning to normal, you still don't necessarily feel connected. A lot of women are feeling isolated, and I think as women, we, we need each other. We need female friends, and we need people to laugh with and to cry with. I'm excited to dive into the topic of joy, but also just to hang out and have fun. Yes. You know? Yeah. I'm new to the Palmyra area and also new to Encounter, and I, I really see this as a great opportunity, being able to get together with women who are in all ages, all stages, and we can all learn from each other. You might be in your 60s and have experienced a lot of different things in life. We can learn from each other and, and grow and encourage one another, and that's what I'm really excited about. It's like hotel-like accommodations at Kenbrook. So it's not like you're roughing it in a cabin, sleeping on the floor. Like you have a bed, your own bathroom. So it's it's very nice. So you have a roommate and that was great because just right off the bat, you have something to connect on because you're staying in the same room together. With meals, there's a whole bunch of circular tables set up and every time you come in for a meal, you can sit at a different table and you just have that organic conversation that just happens over a meal. You can have a full conversation without being interrupted by a child, which we okay. love our children and our interruptions, but it's just a place where you can really get to know somebody. Who doesn't like to have fun, right? Last year, I remember sitting at a table playing games with a couple ladies and laughed the hardest I have laughed in a long time. And, and the two other ladies said the same thing. You should have an amount of self-care that you do for for yourself and I have responsibilities with my older children and work and um, taking care of an elderly mom and, and also just time that you're investing and setting aside be with the Lord and be with other women who are seeking the same 
common goal that is just so refreshing as far as self-care is concerned whatever age whatever stage of life that you're at a reservation you might have is how it's so structured and back to back it's not like that mm -hmm. plenty of free time especially mm -hmm. that big block in the afternoon mm -hmm. play games go on a hike just hang mm -hmm. out read a book there are lots of activities to do there in the center um, on your own so we'd like to invite you to the women's retreat february 18th through 20th at kenbrook bible camp you can register outside in the lobby there's a table right by the glass doors and one of us will be standing right behind it um, please register and pay by january 30th and we will be talking about joy it's not just for older married women hey. <laughs> it's a lot of fun <laughs> it'll be joyous <laughs> The ended part there is really important. Hopefully you were able to hear that. Because it always made me laugh when I saw it. Uh, but good morning, everybody. It's so good to be with you here this morning. Sorry I didn't give you time. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> there it is. Much better. And let's just address the elephant in the room. I've gotten enough conversations this morning. Yes, I cut my hair off. <laughs> I'm not supposed to clap for that. No, I'm just kidding. It's... It's much easier to take care of. I just, we'll just put it that way. But it's so good to be with y'all here this morning. If you're new, you don't even know that I used to have long hair. So it's, but it's, good, it's so good to have you here with us this morning. My name is Ted. I'm one of the pastors here on staff at Encounter Church. Uh, and it's so good to have you here. Just a few things for you to know. After the service, if you head out these back doors and turn to the right, uh, you'll see our Welcome Center. Uh, some very friendly people there would love to greet you. They would love to answer any questions that you might have about the church. Uh, but we also have a gift to give you just for saying, Thank you for choosing to be here with us this morning. And then at that Welcome Center, but also at our information table, you can pick up one of our Connect cards that look like this. Uh, it is just our way of staying connected with you. Please fill one of those out with as much information as you feel comfortable filling out. Uh, and then you can drop those in our offering drop boxes, which are back between these double doors. There's a little wooden box on the ground. Just drop it in the top, uh, and you're good to go. But those Connect cards, you can also put down prayer requests. You can put down comments. Uh, it's, it's a way for us to get you on our church email uh, so that you know various things that are going on in the life of the church. Uh, but if you're more tech savvy and you prefer doing it that way, you can also download our app uh, and you can find information on upcoming events. You can fill out a Connect card electronically. Uh, it's just a really, really great resource. So check that out if you have not done that already. Uh, and that's all the announcements I have for you this morning. And so normally I would transition with the word of prayer, but I'm actually going to turn it over to the worship team uh, who is going to lead us in a prayer this morning. Our lives so small, O oh Lord, our vision limited, our courage so frail, our hours so fleeting. Therefore, give us grace and guidance for the journey ahead. We are gathered here because we believe that we are called together into a work we cannot yet know the fullness of. Still, we trust the voice of the one who has called us. And so we offer to you, O oh God, these things our dreams, our, our plans, plans, our, our vision. vision. Shape them as you will, our, our moments and, and our gifts. gifts. May they be invested toward bright eternal ends. Richly bless the work before us, Father. Shepherd us well, lest we grow enamored of our own accomplishment or entrenched in old habit. Instead, let us listen for your voice our hearts ever open to the quiet beckonings of your spirit in this endeavor. Let us in true humility and poverty of spirit remain ever ready to move at the impulse of your love in paths of your design. You alone, O oh God, by your gracious and life-giving spirit have power to knit our imperfect hearts, our weaknesses, our strengths, our stories and our gifts one to another. Unite your people and then multiply our meager offerings, O Lord, that all might resound to your glory. May our acts of service and creation, frail and wanting as they are, be met and multiplied by the mysterious workings of your spirit, who weaves all things together toward a redemption more good and glorious than we yet have eyes to see or courage to hope for. May our love and our labors now echo your love and your labors, O oh Lord. Let all that we do here in these our brief lives 
in this our brief moment to love, in this the work you have ordained for this community, flower and winsome and beautiful foretaste of greater glories yet to come. O Spirit, Spirit of God, God now shape, shape our hearts. O Spirit, Spirit of God, God now guide our hands. O Spirit, Spirit of God, now build your kingdom among us. Amen. Lift your voice with us, church. Come on. We've seen what you can do, O oh God of wonders. Your power has no end. The things you've done before in greater measure, you will do.
lost my mind to Calvary where Jesus played and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears. They lay him down in Joseph's to the entrance seal by him stone. my brother Sean up to pray for us this morning. Sean is a member of our elder board. And, uh, 
spiritual uh, leader here, and I want you to hear him. Let's pray together, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> Father God, we just thank you, Lord. We thank you for this day that you have made. Father, you're worthy of all praise. You're worthy of all glory. You're worthy of all honor. Lord, we glorify you this morning. Lord, we're thankful that we can come boldly before your throne, that there's no separation between you and I and us, Lord. Father God, we thank you, Father, for your glorious plan for us. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you did not sit, sit on your throne, but you were willing to come off, Lord, and come down and be among us. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you died, you laid your life down for us, and you arose again, and you're seated on the right hand of glory. And Holy Spirit, we just thank you. We thank you that you're our comforter, you're our guide. Holy Spirit, we just ask that you would take control this morning, that your presence would be thick here in this place. Lord, we thank you. We thank you how you're using us. We thank you for the plan that you have for this church. Lord, we just ask that it would not just be here this morning with us, but Lord, it would spill out from us and it would go into the whole world. Lord, we know our enemy has great plans to divide, rob, steal, kill, and destroy. But Lord, you said you have a plan for us to give us life and, and life more abundantly. So Father God, I just ask that we'd be a people that would lift you up, and as we lift you up, you would, we'd bring all men and give you glory. Father God, I thank you. I thank you for uh, the message that's going to come forth this morning. I just ask that it will be from you, from your Holy Spirit. You said your sheep hear your voice, and the voice of another they will not follow. So Lord, I just ask that this morning we would hear your voice, and the voice of another we will not follow and turn to, Lord. Father God, I thank you. I thank you so much for this morning to be able to worship before you, that we are in your courts, Lord, that we can praise your mighty name. Father God, we just give you all glory this morning. You're worthy of all glory. You're worthy of all honor. And we worship you, O Lord. And in your mighty name, Lord Jesus, we glorify you. Amen. I grow as a Christian. Ancient Christians drew on rhythms of spiritual practices to discipline their minds and their bodies for godliness, training their spirits to hear His voice, creating space in their lives for Him to move. Today, we need an awakening to His voice. We need an encounter with Him like never before. This is Jesus. Good morning. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad the sun is shining. At least it was the last time I checked. I need a little sunshine. I went to bed at halftime last night, and that game did not turn out right. <laughs> Just thought you ought to know. Well... Probably for some of you, it did turn out exactly right. Well, I'm glad you're here, and we're going to talk some more about spiritual dis disciplines, that little lead-in, uh, how you grow, how you become more like Jesus. Uh, it's kind of a fantasy of mine that God would just download everything in my brain and I would do it right, right? It, just, um, it doesn't work that way. Uh, we tend to have our children in our households for, I don't know, 18 years, maybe a little less, sometimes a little more, yes. But it takes time, and it takes effort, and it takes work. Well, when you're trying to follow Jesus, this is the Follow Me series that we began with Ted a couple of weeks ago with uh, Count the Cost, and then last week, Inner Spiritual Disciplines. This week, Corporate Spiritual Disciplines. This is the things we do together. And then... We'll follow on next week with kind of the foundation of where this all comes from, the motivation, God's love, and how he's changing the world as we are changed from the inside out. John chapter 10, verse 27, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. God speaks. He speaks in his word. He speaks through his Holy Spirit. 
But amazingly, he speaks through you and me as we give time to hear each other and listen to each other. Now, I believe that is a work of the Holy Spirit, but we need each other. And so we're going to talk about spiritual guidance this morning. Well, there are many corporate spiritual disciplines, the things we do together. Worship is one of them, and that's where, why we're here today, to sing, to pray, to gather together, to hear the Lord together. True worshipers, Jesus said, worship in spirit and in truth. And he said this to the woman of Samaria. And she's got questions. She's got theological questions. Why do you Jews say we need to worship down in Jerusalem? We Samaritans worship in the north, in Mount Gerizim. So what's the deal there? And Jesus says, listen, true worshipers worship in spirit and in truth. The location doesn't matter. Maybe the format doesn't matter. What matters is that people come to God who speaks and in, a, in an attitude and an atmosphere of listening. My sheep listen to my voice. So we gather together to worship. The essence of worship, I believe, comes right out of the great commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor is yourself. So we lift up God as our king, our maker, our creator, the one who guides us, teaches us, shows us the way, and then we are obligated to share that with our neighbor, to love our neighbor as ourselves. That's worship. We also celebrate together. You know, we gathered for uh, Christmas Eve here this past month, and it was a beautiful occasion, candles and all the rest, Christmas carols, and we celebrate the arrival of our Lord Jesus into this world. There was an occasion Jesus, as an adult, enters the synagogue. The scroll is given to him, and he reads. He reads from the prophet Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor to pro proclaim freedom for the prisoner, to restore the sight of the blind, to offer the oppressed release, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Well, that ought to be good news to anybody who is experiencing the oppression, the weight of the world. Those folks in Jesus' time were Oppressors, Romans, were in charge. They were brutal. They were awaiting the arrival of the Messiah who would set them free. So these words are good news. Isaiah writing 600 years before Jesus. Jesus announcing his arrival. When the reading is over, the scroll is returned to its place. Jesus sits down with every eye fixed on him and I suspect there was stunning silence when he says, Today, in your hearing, this scripture has been fulfilled. It gives tingles in my spine right now. So there's celebration. We celebrate what God is, has done, what he's going to do. Years and years ago, this would go back to the 70, mid-70s, <clears throat> I had the obligation of transporting a group school bus full of junior high and senior high students to a joint community sunrise service at Portland, Oregon's Memorial Coliseum. We were up at some horrible hour, like 4 o'clock, because they were going to gather this choir together and they were going to rehearse before the audience arrived. I don't know how many people were there. It seats like 12,000, 13,000 people, as I recall. And it was full, and people from all over the community, and this mass choir, and a special speaker. His name was Eldridge Cleaver. If you're under 50, you probably don't even recognize the name. He was the leader and activist of the Black Panther movement. We would call him today a domestic terrorist group. But he had an encounter with Jesus Christ. 
And on that Easter sunrise service at Memorial Coliseum, he told his story. Now, I didn't know this would happen, but when the service ends, there are powered motors that lift up the shades. The whole Colosseum, the auditorium there, is encased in glass. And so the choir sings, Christ the Lord is risen today, and the, the shades go up. And it, well, I still remember it as sending tingles through my whole body. Celebration. We do that together. I don't know if you come to church with an expectation of celebration. Sometimes the weight of the world is what we're carrying when we come to church. But we anticipate celebration. We also gather together corporately to do confession. Now, normally, we think of confession as a private matter. I bring my sins before the Lord and ask for his forgiveness. And and he provides his forgiveness and absolution of my sins. Very personal, very private. However, I want you to understand that there is a larger picture to that, and I think there needs to be. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a martyr in Nazi Germany in 1945, wrote these words, By myself I remain in darkness. But with my brother and my confession, I come into the light. We need to be able to hear each other and hear each other's burdens and heartaches and be able to accept each other's weaknesses and failures and sins and be able to offer forgiveness and healing. It's a pretty sensitive matter. But as a group, as a people, we need to know how to do that. When the prodigal son had gone off to the far country and wasted his life and his resources on wild living, he comes to his senses, the Bible says, and he returns home to his father's house and he offers confession. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. And the father welcomes him home with celebration, not with condemnation, with celebration. We need to learn how to do that. Well, I want to spend most of my time this morning with you in talking about the corporate discipline of guidance, or maybe better understood as discernment. There are in any church people who have been granted the gift of discernment. Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 puts it as a portrayal of discerning among spirits, discerning what's true and what's not true, true prophecy, false prophecy, a troublemaker or a honored person of unity. So we need discernment. I would ask you the question today, where are those people? Do you know them? And if you don't, especially if in, your, in any role of leadership here, uh, church leadership, Sunday school class leadership, children, youth leadership, who are those people that you can count on to have the gift of discernment that can tell you the truth, even if it's uncomfortable, to lead you into a place where God is there and God is real? And where's the prophet? Uh, The prophets in the Old Testament spoke the truth. Thus saith the Lord was often the way their prophecies began. So here's this human voice, but it's been in the counsel of God Almighty and the opportunity is presented and they declare the truth. Thus saith the Lord. Sometimes it was devastating, their message. Often the people responded, we don't want to hear it. Jeremiah was probably the most famous of those kinds of people's response was, Jeremiah, why are you such a troublemaker? Why don't you go home? Why don't you stop this nonsense? But he had to speak the truth, and he said it burned like a fire in him, and he had to let it out, and he did. Oh, he paid the price for it. We need those people too. This guidance that comes from on high through God's chosen servants 
the gift of discernment, the gift of prophecy. Where is the prophet today? In my lifetime, I think I would only name two people who were prophets, modern day prophets. You might have a different list, I don't know. But the two that come to mind for me are Martin Luther King, who could address this country's history of racism and to do it with a clarity call of there's something better for us. We've got to stop tearing each other apart. And he did it in a nonviolent way. It wasn't an insurrection. It was a call to unity and peace, but also to forgive and to love. I have a dream, he said. Well, that's one of my designated prophets in my memory. The other is Pope John Paul II, who had his roots in totalitarianism in Poland in the Cold War era. And out of his position as a priest and then ultimately as the leader of the Roman Catholic Church became a, a spokesman for God. There is a picture, I, I just coming to my mind now, I wish I could show it to you right now, but I didn't think of it soon enough, of him in a prison cell with a man who tried to assassinate him, wounded him severely, but Pope John Paul II recovered, and he goes to this prison cell, and there's a picture of him laying his hands on his assassin, offering forgiveness. Those gifts of the prophecy and of the discernment of gifts is important, and we need to know who those people are. Pray for them. Pray for the prophet. Well, spiritual guidance working here at Encounter Church, how does it work? Well, there's lots of ways it works. Number one, I'd say there is the corporate experience of worship. So when we gather like this, we are experiencing guidance. You are teaching me. I hope I can share some things with you. But we do that in lots of ways. We need each other, small groups, classes, church services, all sorts of ways in which we hear from each other. We understand how our relationship to each other works, how God is here to invest himself in life-transforming experiences. And then we learn from God. So we have a corporate experience of worship, of celebration, and of confession. We also, at church encounters, like Encounter Church, have the corporate exercise of spiritual gifts. God pours out his gifts upon us. Gifts of faith, gifts of prophecy, gifts of interpretation of tongues and tongues, gifts of service, gifts of people who have evangelistic skills, who have pastor skill, teacher skills. If you count them all up, there's 20-some gifts itemized in the New Testament. These work in corporate experience when we gather together. And so we need those gifts. We also experience God working at Encounter Church through the expression of the, uh, the fruit of the Spirit. We are all, if we are baptized into the Spirit, if we put our faith in Jesus Christ, given fruit. The fruit of the Spirit to go to work and to bless people. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Paul says, against these things, there is no law. You are free to do this. God wants you to do this. I take a quote here from George Fox. I think they'll all project it. George Fox was a 17th century mystic, the founder of the Quaker movement. He says, dwell in the life and love and power and wisdom of God. Now, just let that settle in. Dwell in it. That's what we're doing this morning. We're dwelling in it. We're sitting and absorbing it in the life and love and power and wisdom of God, in unity one with another and with God. And the peace and wisdom of God fill your hearts that nothing may rule in you but the life which stands in the Lord God. 
it's old writing. The punctuation is a little odd. But it's an invitation to enter into a relationship, a dwelling place where these gifts of the Spirit, where these corporate expressions of worship, fruit of the Spirit, spiritual gifts, spiritual discernment are unleashed. But we need each other. Do you notice that when a crisis happens, somebody is really, really sick, or somebody had an accident, or somebody found out that they had cancer, we respond to those big, urgent matters pretty well, most churches do. But how many among us, even seated right here this morning, that aren't up against a crisis, but they're drowning? Things aren't going well. The marriage is in trouble, and maybe nobody even knows it. The kids are struggling, and maybe even I don't know how to open that up, and I don't know how to share it with somebody. I'm a mess, and I don't know how to confess. I don't know how to make my, my needs known. We need each other. So I want you to do something just to wake you up for one thing. Um, I want to do a little corporate exercise here. And this is the way it's going to go. Uh, we're going to say to each other this statement. Listen closely. God loves you and so do I. So say it with me right now. God loves you and so do I. Now, whoever's sitting close to you, in fact, maybe, maybe I'll have you stand up. Would you do that? And if you're separated from somebody, make a few movements to get close enough to at least one person and go to work. Say it right now to somebody. God loves you and so do I. <laughs> Very good. You may be seated. If I let that go on any longer, you'll soon be talking about what you're having for lunch. So, um, The way we interact with each other can be so simple, but we make it harder than it really is. And I'm glad you could share rather freely in that greeting. God loves you and so do I. What I want to spend the remaining few moments of my time with is a couple of Bible stories about how God guides how God changes things. If I had a title for this, I would say it, these are turning points in church history. Turning points. At this moment, things took a new direction. Now, in every church, there are some stories like that. I hope you've heard some of them about Encounter Church. It's past, it's history. But in every church, there ought to be these turning points. This happened, or so-and-so said this, or this unfolded over here, and pretty soon it has consequences, and we live in a new realm. Well, here's a story from the, Gos er, from the Acts of the Apostles that is one of those turning points. Well, actually, there's two of them. Acts chapter 10 is the first one. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. In other words, he's a Roman. In other words, he's the enemy at least if you're a God-fearing, faithful Jew. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. Oh, so there's a spiritual side to him. He gave generously to those in need and prayed for God, to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. Now, that's remarkable all by itself. God gives visions to Gentiles and to Romans. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner whose house is by the sea. And so... Cornelius believes it, sends servants to go and uh, make contact with Peter and invite him, ask him to come back to Cornelius's place to tell him what he must do. At the same time, Peter is in Joppa and he has a vision. 
Now, already you know that God has kind of put two and two together here for the Jews, Peter, the Gentiles, Cornelius. Peter has a vision. About noon, he became hungry, and as he was waiting for food to be prepared, he went up to the rooftop to pray. He fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. And then a voice told him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said what uh, any God, good God-fearing Jew would have said. Surely not, Lord. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. You know, when you start reading Leviticus, you kind of scratch your head and what is this all about? Well, it's all these laws and all these regulations about how you manage your life and what you eat and what you don't eat and all of those things. But the voice came to Peter after he said, No, listen, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. The sheet comes down, goes up, comes down, goes up. Three times this happens. And Peter is not given a clue what this is about, except in that same time frame, these servants from Cornelius' house show up and say, our, our master has asked for your attendance at his place. And Peter's wondering about what his vision was and what these men are talking about Cornelius' vision is all about. He agrees to go and he meets and Cornelius was there and had gathered a large group of people and he tells Peter what happened to him. Cornelius did. And Peter then has some context to frame what happened to him in his vision, that sheet with all kinds of things. And after that encounter, Peter says this. Here's the turning point. Peter began to speak. I now realize. Oh, wake up. Peter, all of a sudden, is made aware. God is talking to him. But notice the corporate context of this. It took a Roman centurion. It took some servants. It took some time. It took some effort to get together and to hear from each other the corporate discernment and guidance that's going on here, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation, including Romans, including Gentiles, the one who fears him and does what is right. Now imagine for a moment if that occasion had never happened. With this experience, Peter is made aware of God's great universal worldwide plan of bringing salvation to all people, not just the chosen people. If this had not happened, imagine what Christianity might be today. It might be just a narrow, small sect of people dictated by time and place and people but now that the gospel doors have been opened wide and the missionary gospel goes out to the ends of the earth, did you know, I didn't know this until I did mission work for a number of years in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa. Africa is the most Christianized nation in, in the continent, I should say, in the world. The most Christian. There are churches everywhere. And some of them aren't built out of bricks or anything. Some of them are meeting out under a tree or in somebody's house. Now, I don't mind telling you, having spent some time there, it is also the most confusing Christianity I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> I'm afraid, though, if those Africans showed up here this morning, they would say, you guys are very confused. <laughs> well, we need to learn from each other. But the missionary doors flew wide open. Africa has been being evangelized only since the mid-19th century. David Livingston and others. And here it is, how the gospel spread rapidly and widely. The largest church in the world is in Seoul, Korea. 
Go figure. God is doing his thing. I'm afraid we North Americans have a very short-sightedness about what God is doing in this world. Don't you think? God is moving. And sometimes we only get a little glimpse of it here and there, but God is on the march. So we need each other. We need Holy Spirit guidance and discernment. We need the gospel available to everybody. Oh, there's hurdles. There's criticism. Peter got criticized. How dare you? So we have to live with that. But in the process, God is doing his work. One other story comes from Acts chapter 15. Now, what had happened with Cornelius as a Gentile and his household, they become saved. The Holy Spirit is poured out on them. And they are stunned that this has happened to a Gentile. And then Peter says, well, is there any reason we can't baptize these folks? And they go ahead and baptize them. Well, the criticism comes. And then there's this meeting. There's this meeting of the leaders of the church because they need to understand how to proceed from here. Verse 1, chapter 15, certain people came down from Judea, that's where Jerusalem is, to Antioch, and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. Oh boy, here, here comes the argument. Doesn't matter if you put your faith in Christ, if you haven't been circumcised, you cannot be saved. So here, here's the debate. Verse 2, this brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some believers, to go up to Jerusalem and see the apostles and elders about this question. How, how are we going to respond? What's the right thing to do? Their whole history said circumcision is the way in which we acknowledge a person's identity as a part of the family of God, the chosen people of God. How are we going to proceed? The church sent them on their way. And when they arrived in Jerusalem, the story is repeated again. Peter had this encounter with Cornelius and his household. They put faith in Christ. They got baptized. The Holy Spirit was poured out on them. But some who were gathered in this uh, high-powered meeting, who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. So the apostles and elders met to consider the question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them, Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. The whole assembly, after hearing Peter's speech, became silent. It's one of the um, evidences of the movement of the Holy Spirit. Things get very, very quiet. The whole assembly became quiet as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. And when they finished, James, presumably the brother of the Lord, spoke up. Brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God has first intervened to choose people for his name from the Gentiles. And then he quotes from the prophets. These prophets that have spoken these words <clears throat> centuries before, but they speak of the Gentiles coming to faith in God. And so after he quotes the scriptures, the prophets, he says, it is my judgment, turning point, discernment, guidance. James says, it is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from foods polluted by idols and from other things. And so the apostles and the elders and the whole church decided 
to send this message of the Gentiles being welcomed into the church back to Antioch so that they might understand. They craft the letter, and in the letter it says this. Here's this leadership council in Jerusalem sending back a letter to those in Antioch. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. And again, some of those things about food, sacrifice to idols, and so on. It seemed good to us and to the Holy Spirit. The guidance that comes from the gathering of God's people, listening for the voice of the Holy Spirit, listening to each other as we share that voice through each other, and then we make choices. And because of those two events, the church would never, ever, ever, ever be the same. Paul begins his missionary journeys. Peter engages in church leadership. Tradition tells us Thomas went east to India and the church was started there. And so the explosion centered in Jerusalem and this council that blows off the doors of that minor, small little group of believers now becomes a worldwide movement. The fire spreads and it is still spreading. Well, how do we do this? How do we incorporate Gentiles into the body of Christ? Well, they made their decision. Discernment. With it comes a lot of controversy, sharp disagreement. It was right after this happens in Acts 15 that Paul and Barnabas have a falling out, a personal dispute that was so significant they separated. They went their separate ways. I've been in the church long enough to know that we don't always agree. But I've also known that God uses even our controversies to bring glory to himself. Paul chose Silas, they went this way. Barnabas shows some others that went with him, and now we've got a two-front evangelistic movement going on. They've got this quote for you from Dallas Willard. The aim of God in history is the creation of an all-inclusive community of loving persons with himself, that is God, included in that community as its prime sustainer and most glorious inhabitant. I leave you with this challenge today. Galatians 5.25 says, Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. If you don't have the Spirit, none of this discernment happens. Pray for one another, your brothers and sisters here in Christ at Encounter, to daily seek the Holy Spirit-inspired guidance. We need each other. And we cannot move ahead and discern where God is taking us without each other and without the Spirit. Lord, in your name we gather today to worship, to celebrate, to confess, and to discern. God, today, meet us right where we're at. Maybe we've got personal questions that really need an answer. And your people and your your experiences of worship and church and classes and small groups and all the rest becoming a platform by which we hear you. So Lord, meet us here. Hear our questions. Hear our heartaches. Hear our confessions. And then Lord, lead us into your presence so that your church might know and that your church might move out with authority and power. And that Palmyra might be changed, but in a much better sense, a much bigger sense, that our nation might be changed. Oh, as a country, we are in trouble. Lord, help us. And then that our world might be changed. Oh, Lord, you've been down this road for 2,000 years. And we now occupy a little space here and now, but give us vision, Lord. Give us a heart full of love that your world might meet our world and that we might be changed. We pray this in Jesus' name.
there's all kinds of things that seize our heart, uh, return us, sure us up. Uh, give us the discipline, the motivation, the hunger and thirst for spiritual discipline. So we know it results in being more like you. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Turn your attention to the announcement for you and church family. Church family, I hope that you were encouraged by the service today. I know that I was. And as you go throughout your week, I want to encourage you to make sure that you're taking time to be in God's word, to listen and pray and be in communion with God. Here are a few announcements that I wanna make you aware of. If you're new or if you've been attending for a while and you just wanna know what is Encounter all about, then come to this class. You're gonna to get to know the heart of who we are as Encounter Church. Uh, you're gonna to get to know some of the staff members that will be there. There's still time to RSVP. So reach out to office at encounterchurchofpalmyra.org. A quick reminder about the women's retreat. All signups and payments are due next Sunday, February 30th. You can stop by the table in the lobby to sign up. Make sure you come. It's gonna be an amazing time to get to know women from the church here, so sign up. Also, we wanna let you know about our child dedications. They have been rescheduled for Sunday, February 6th. So make sure if you're interested to get your stuff in and your RSVPs by February 1st. All right, church family, that's it. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week and can't wait you know, to see you next Sunday. The, the word church family around a lot, but we truly mean it. It is so wonderful to have you here. No matter how long you've been here, uh, it is just a true, true blessing to be together. Just a real quick reminder of Pastor Vern's uh, challenge from this morning. Uh, Galatians 5, 25 says this, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Pray for one another. Pray for your brothers and sisters in this church and around the world and seek Holy Spirit inspired guidance. It truly is a, a really, really good challenge for all of us. Uh, one, one quick thing. So it, the uh, announcement, they said February 30th is the due date for the women's retreat. It's actually January 30th, right? Right? number wrong month. But so next Sunday, January 30th, register for that. It's awesome. If you're having trouble plugging in and you're a female here, just join. My, my wife went the first year, went the second year. She was like, I need to go back. And she was like 37 weeks pregnant. I was like, if you're sure. She had such a good time. It meant that much to her that she was willing to chance it. And it worked out. It was fine. But it was a really, really good trip. So uh, sign up in the lobby if, if that's something that you're able to do. Um, and then uh, the Discovering Encounter class next week. Uh, this is my first chance to actually teach it, so I'm excited about that. You should come and join us if you're curious to find out more about the church. It's going to be great. Uh, as you're heading out, uh, the offering drop boxes are between these back doors. If you've, give, um, if you've come prepared to give tithes and offerings, thank you so much for willingness to give back to God out of what He has given to us. And for those of you who give online, thank you so much for that as well. As always, our prayer banner is over here um, after the service if you would like some prayer. But have a fantastic week. Go in the Lord, and we'll see you back next Sunday. God bless.